Hey everybody, this is Peter Joseph, March 25th, 2015. I hope everyone's doing well out there. What I'd like to do today, rather than answer more questions or ramble on in various subjects that have probably been talked about before, is actually feature some Z-Day talks from the Berlin, Germany event on March 14th. These will make it online in video form, uh, one by one as we move along. I think a couple of them are already getting there this week. But those that haven't or have been uh, already uploaded, I'm going to play some of them during the radio show as uh, the weeks move forward. And I hope to get some others from around the world from other Z-Day events and to feature them either in excerpt or in full. So we're going to start with Ben McLeish, who did an introduction to the Zeitgeist Movement, again at Z-Day, and then it's going to immediately segue into Origins and Adaptations Part 3, my lecture from the event. So that's pretty much all I'm going to say due to the time, or, time restraints of this particular broadcast, so I hope everyone enjoys. Here is Ben McLeish with the Zeitgeist Worldview. We have a packed day for you, and we're only running 15 minutes late already, so I'm going to skip my talk and uh, go straight to the end. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Problem solved. All right. In all seriousness, uh, I, will, I will go through what the day holds um, towards the end of this talk. Uh, the goal of this very brief introduction is really just to give you an idea of the position that the Zeitgeist Movement inhabits uh, versus not just uh, the social system that we are uh, upgirded by and surrounded by, but actually also of other organizations that are present in the battle to put uh, pressure on the system for change. Now, clarifying this should make clear to you, if you're wondering sort of what the movement is or what it stands for or why this entity exists and uh, the nature of this battle uh, you have ahead of you. It's going to give you an idea of that. Uh, the talks that follow will then fill in, so to speak, uh, the tenets and goals of the movement, actions you can take, and the other angles regarding education, technology, and so forth. So here at the start, I want to sort of outline the basic position, uh, where the argument really starts. So, pop quiz time. Uh, activists amongst you, who said that? Do you know? Anybody? Who? Lawrence Lessig. Good guess, actually. It's a, he's a secondary source for that. It's much older than that. It's 161 years old, so either Mr. Lessig has some fucking brilliant pills on him, uh, or it was someone else. Uh, that was actually Henry David Thoreau, writing in Walden. Uh, uh, the Re Reflections at Walden Pond, I think it was called. Yes, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Now, okay, every two-bit activist knows that quotation, including myself. It's, it is one of the more memorable lines of uh, Henry David Thoreau's work, who's a very famous uh, abolitionist, really, in his time. He's now used very often by uh, the anarchist uh, movement. Um, in fact, actually, this is why you're sort of secondarily correct. The, the term uh, root striker uh, is, was used by Lawrence Lessig to attempt to try and get money out of politics. <laughs> uh, forgive me while I laugh at that, because it is a, a worthy campaign, but it's a very tricky one to do within the system, isn't it? Because who can run politics without money? Uh, the millions and millions that enable uh, politicians to even do that presupposes it's going to be an almost impossible task. Um, okay, it's still worth fighting the lobbying critique, but by doing that, you are including as a presupposition that you are happy with the monetary system and that you're happy with the political system as well, that a political system has to exist. Um, so it is a sort of a, an, an irony, really, that if uh, Lessig were to quote you the entire sentence, that's not even a complete sentence up there, you would actually see that it says, it goes, by the way, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root, and it may be that he who bestows the largest amount of time and money on the needy is doing the most by his mode of life to produce that misery which he strives in vain to relieve. It is the pious slave breeder devoting the proceeds of every tenth slave to buy a Sunday's liberty for the rest. Thoreau wasn't doing anything but talking about the damage caused by charity. No wonder that's not quoted in its full capacity. Do you feel your heartstrings tugging in the wrong direction on that? Oh my God, he's against charity and helping people? What a terrible human he must be. But of course, Thur is not really saying that, right? Um, of course, his real sentiment is nothing of the sort. He recognizes that a mode of life that you've assumed sort of You've assumed a set of values that are uh, self-imprisoning, and they can actually present uh, real problems with trying to get uh, solutions in place 
uh, from sort of being applied, those solutions. They're sort of presupposed out of the equation. And it is this sort of false, economy, uh, false dichotomy that doesn't allow you to opt out of the value system you're inhabiting. Either we all give, usually, money to charity and we feel like we're doing something, or we don't give to charity and claim that either the problem in question isn't really a problem, uh, or that those suffering it are somehow at fault themselves for getting themselves there, uh, or that there's, my favorite, no alternative, and it may be an awful situation, but that's life, that's just the way it is. So, as I said before, Thoreau was writing 161 years ago, 1854, um, and his great battle at the time was mostly the slave trade, uh, the abolitionist stance that uh, is fairly regularly quoted by the anarchist cause these days. But, of course, these days we have a different, and I would argue much more serious set of issues, uh, which needs striking at that root. But where you might have felt a twinge of outrage at Thoreau's charity notion, because we're not used to sort of rejecting that idea, how do you feel about this? Coke is literally more important when it comes to sustainability than the United Nations. How do you feel about that? Who said that? Was it me just now in 2015? <laughs> Abby Martin guessed it was the Coke brothers. The CEO of WWF Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, know your enemy. We are now in a position where the social system itself has essentially borrowed, co-opted, or otherwise assimilated the efforts which we consider to be contrary to the system. The World Wildlife Fund was something I used to collect as a kid. You have the little stickers in the sticker book, and your goal is to do something other than what Gerald Butts, of the, the CEO of the WWF, said. I wish that were a, 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 a separate case, but unfortunately, now we're seeing with things like the WWF and WaterAid and many, many other people that are partnering with corporates uh, in order to achieve short-term, non-system-changing goals and as a trade-off getting some kind of uh, leeway, some kind of way of achieving something, even if it's not much compared to what we set out to do originally, is almost the way that the system works um, by itself. There's no grand conspiracy for it. You can't get things done without money. And if you're Greenpeace, you actually start to internalize the way that a corporation works for your activism. That's why they have a CEO. That's why Greenpeace is incorporated. It's why they have goals, aims, objectives, a whole set of behaviors that mimic and are, in fact, uh, the same as a corporate output as well. Um, in fact, it was put much better than I've just tried to put it to you by Peter Deverne and uh, Genevieve Le Baron, who uh, said in their book, Protest Incorporated, uh, across uh, the global south and the global north, many communities, groups, and grassroots movements are resisting and rejecting corporatization. Nevertheless, corporatization is altering the context within which such groups organize, raising the financial and legal stakes of tactics such as direct action. Those NGOs striving to reform capitalist institutions seem especially prone to corporatization. At first, this finding may seem counterintuitive, yet in many ways it is perfectly logical given the power of capitalism to assimilate criticism and dissent. So, to put it in more fancifully for you, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, as a French uh, sociologist, put it like this, uh, the most successful ideological effects are those which have no need of words and ask no more than complicitous silence. It follows, incidentally, that any analysis of ideologies in the narrow sense of legitimating discourses, which fails to include an analysis of the corresponding institutional mechanisms, is liable to be no more than a contribution to the efficacy of those ideologies. The fate of modern activist organizations, uh, as they increasingly partner with organizations and corporates, seems to demonstrate that that's true. By the way, the, that is literally a Google image result for Pierre Bourdieu there, so uh, I thought I'd put it in. I'm pretty sure that it, it's legitimate. I'm pretty sure that's him. The long and short of it is this. The worldview you will encounter with the Zeitgeist Movement evaluates the importance of the planet and life on it absent the trappings of government, countries, voting for political parties, and ultimately the market itself. The worldview maintains that these are artificial constructs, cultural leftovers, which contain in them the same switch in values which has created such an unsustainable and destructive way of life. Um, 
where life value, the inherent necessity and importance of the health of the planet and the life on it, has been replaced by the wealth value of the various permutations of the modern paradigm of the market and money as an end in itself. Uh, any charity or NGO uh, sits within that shift in values and is absorbed by it. Uh, it's that shift in values itself which makes the system so good at is assimilating dissent. Again, no conspiracy. As long as you change the rules of the game, no one can be nice when you're playing Monopoly. Um, so that's really what we have there. It's literally why Coke is more important than the United Nations to Gerald Butts of the WWF. But we maintain we can't resolve the real problems of our age without getting at that shift in values, that beginning the argument before uh, the traditional and agreed notions of looking after things. I wonder how Coca-Cola feels about that. Okay, so let's remind ourselves of what the real problems are then. Uh, one useful aggregate view of the human situation is the doomsday clock, which has been maintained by a group at the Bulletin for the Atomic Scientists since 1947. Uh, that was the point in, sort of in the 20th century where the modern era awoke to the threat, not just of the atomic bomb, but of the wider truth that human technology now traverses national boundaries and threatens the entire ecosystem in ways that prior weaponry or human behavior just simply hadn't. Um, as of 2015, January, this group states that uh, unchecked climate change, global nuclear weapons modernization, and outsized nuclear weapons arsenals pose extraordinary and undeniable threats to the continued existence of humanity, and world leaders have failed to act with the speed or on the scale required to protect citizens from potential catastrophes. These failures of political leadership endanger every person on Earth. Despite some modestly positive developments uh, in the climate change arena, current efforts are entirely insufficient to prevent a catastrophic warming of the Earth. Meanwhile, the United States and Russia have embarked on massive programs to modernize their nuclear triads, thereby undermining uh, existing nuclear weapons treaties. The clock sits now at just three minutes to midnight because international leaders are failing to perform the most important duty, ensuring and preserving the health and vitality of human civilization. These guys are perhaps not very fun at parties, uh, but their words can't be ignored. Somewhere along the way, we have misunderstood our habitat, the nature of the planet we live on. We have taken a spherical, singular, holistic planet and have divided it up by war, expropriation, false divisions of race, class, and nationality. We have discovered the natural world and our co-inhabitants, the animals, and have treated it and them as a plunderbox to be despoiled of resources and a presumed infinite skip for the toxic waste we leave in our wake. We have devolved our responsibilities for decision-making from the participatory thoughts of individuals and local communities to the wealthy and mindlessly power-hungry who preside over the state architecture, who are not bound to deliver on their platforms, and and we are then surprised when we can't use the resultant legislation to correct the course we now find ourselves on. And we have taken the great promises of technology and scientific discovery and have for a great part used these understandings to produce largely pointless commodities and self-regarding entertainment, which leaves us hollow, lonely, full of artificial wants and unnecessary desires, the perfect, communa co co sorry, the perfect consumer mindset. I find it even hard to say the word consumption these days. <laughs> we are at once surrounded by and utterly separated from our planetary home when it comes to the values of our social system. In fact, I would argue that we are not even home yet. Now, an objection you will hear at this point goes something like this. Well, perhaps these are just growing pains. Nothing's perfect, right guys? After all, you have to break an omelet to make some eggs. Uh, you know, listen, the rate of absolute poverty has decreased from 1.9 billion people living on $1.25 a day in 1990 to, my, best, my favorite use of the word only, only 1.4 billion as of 2005. Well, that's true. What an unbelievable success, I suppose. Uh, except that now 2.6 billion of us find ourselves on less than $2 a day and 80% of the world lives on less than $10 a day for all their needs. All transport, all healthcare, all housing, all food, everything. The 2007 Human Development Report says that more than 80% of the world's population lives in countries where income differentials are, in fact, widening. And to bring us right up to date, as of 2015, Oxfam predicts that next year the richest 1% of the world will own more than the remaining 99%. There's only one thing you could accuse Occupy for, and it's being slightly too early. Um, so there we go. Well done, Occupy. Who is willing 
to speak against these statistics and claim that we are remotely in possession of a system that cares about them or their fellow human being, even in pure financial terms? Who would be brave enough to insult their intelligence in public in this manner? Help yourself. I can't do it. But having brought you down this way and made you sob inside, there are reasons to be cheerful. Raise Gaudere for the Latin folks amongst you. The age of networked humanity is in fact here. People can now self-organize incredibly quickly and without an authority structure required at the outset. 3D printing technologies now allow for localized manufacturing. There's, we've got one here, go and have a look at it, it's at the back. Uh, maybe not right now, uh, my ego would suffer. Um, in fact, one of my favorite ones is that, that one on the right there. That's, the, that's Germany's first 3D printed car, the Erbi. This is now at least in its second generation. Um, which really allows us to, uh, in Buckminster Fuller's terms, really uh, achieve a, an ephemeralization, using much, much less to do much, much more and serve individuals and communities in those ways. Um, the same technology of 3D printing now promises rapidly deployable next generation agriculture or housing. It's distributed and resilient manufacturing. Innovations in renewable energy uh, that are required for the removal away from fossil fuels also means that they're distributed and more resilient types of energy forces that are going to be involved in our future. And innovations in education mean that we've now the opportunity to prepare our children for the difficulties of updating the culture we already face now and into which struggle they have been placed by us. Now, you have to fight for this kind of technology. It runs opposite to the market system. Uh, the same 3D printing technology which can home manufacture a prosthetic limb for pennies, where it used to be thousands of dollars, can be used to manufacture guns as well. Renewable energy can still be used for destructive purposes. And problem solvers can still be used to rain down tyranny on populations. Abundance enabling technologies are not welcome where scarcity is useful for control and for profit. It won't happen by itself. It needs to be demanded. And the case for a global economy based on natural law and resources and support and sustainability needs to be made. Humorously, if you could, please, but certainly firmly and clearly. This is why the Zeitgeist Movement isn't just a science fetish club, but one which uh, recognizes that without the value shift based on a thoroughly and holistically understanding uh, of the world around, how it affects us, how human behavior is shaped by a social and natural environment, that's what we need. Uh, we can't hope for, technolo uh, for technologies and scientific process uh, to be put to use for solving our problems, which as we've seen, uh, leaves us with three minutes to spare before midnight. The remaining talks today are going to cover in detail the Zeitgeist Movement as an organization, education for the young and how it's tied to motivation, care of Jim Phillips. We have guests from America in the form of uh, Peter Joseph, Brandon Christie, and Abby Martin, recently of Russia Today and Media Roots, each covering more aspects of the worldview we are trying to promote into existence here. Uh, there are talks on perception and human fallibility, uh, thanks to Stefan Kengen in, in advance for that one. Uh, open source ecology is going to give us a view of uh, how this technology looks on the ground, what it looks like when you really apply technologies for the uh, global village construction set, as they call it, um, and many more talks besides that will fill in the blanks that I've happily skipped over. So get involved, get talking, get discussing, and seek to do what Henry David Thoreau proudly uh, said we should do by striking at those roots. Thank you very much. All right. So I did a series called Origins and Adaptations, 2012 and 2014, respectively. It was supposed to end there, but I decided to continue. This dealt historically with the uh, capitalist economy, and I wanted to show how the system worked, where it came from, how it's evolved, and a lot of things I think everybody here must be very, very aware of by now. Uh, we should all be well aware that most everything we are experiencing in the world today, from ecological decline to endless government business corruption to human exploitation to perpetual poverty to constant war to growing unemployment to debt collapse and to the overall value system disorder has been predictable 
predictable when viewing the state of the world through the prism of current economic functionality. And from this system-based worldview, we can not only better understand the past and the present, we can also anticipate, of course, what is in store for the future as this social cancer continues to morph and grow and mutate and absorb and, in effect, decouple humanity from everything most fundamental to our long-term social and ecological sustainability. So before I close this subject, which has been drilled in at length, I want to re-summarize the issue with a quote by a man named Gary Holthus. Our economics, social life, politics, and schools have insisted that having more toys is better than having fewer toys, that buying stuff is good for us, that we have to keep up with or exceed others in our consumption, that a high-paying job can take the place of meaningful work, that low-paying, meaningless jobs that demean our humanity are better than none, and we should be grateful for them because they will turn us into decent citizens, and that a free market has the same powers as a just God. But capitalism rests ultimately not on innovation or entrepreneurship or brains or even a free market. Those are just stories. Stories we like to tell ourselves because they make those who are successful look good. At its base, industrial capitalism success rests on exploitation of resources, racism, child abuse, sexism, and war. But even more than all these, contemporary capitalism rests on consumption, government and corporate consumption of resources, technology and scientific research, and citizen consumption of market goods. We are asked to consume not only material goods, but ideas, policies, whole world views that are presented with all the persuasive skills and battering psychological hype that can be bought. We are under assault. We are laid siege by hype, corporate hype, political hype, military hype, educational hype, commercial hype, and as our civil rights have declined in recent years, freedom has come to mean the freedom to choose among 16 brand names of one product. This is the harvest of a culture so bent on growth with all possible speed that it will pour 100,000 chemicals in the earth and atmosphere into our lakes and groundwater and oceans before it has a clue about the long-term effects of a single one of them. Now, that out of the way, what I'd like to do here, take the terms origins, adaptations, change the context a bit. Instead of how the current economic system has evolved, let's look at the other side. What is the technical history, for example, of this logic we might term a natural law resource-based economy? And more importantly, what is its relationship to the evolution of material culture? This term abundance we often flagrantly toss out. What does this evolution suggest about ourselves, our psychology, our sociology, even our nature, as the deeply social organisms we are? Now, I have to warn you, uh, this presentation is a bit stream of consciousness. I'm less interested in defining a whole set of ideas, but I want you to more or less entertain the concepts I put forward, even though naturally I'll be drawing some conclusions. Here is a table of contents. If you can read it in the back, I'm sorry. If you can't read it, I'm sorry. By a man named John Eltzler. Some of the themes might sound eerily familiar if you read these contents. We have chapters on the power of wind, tide, waves. We have chapters on systems of machineries and the establishment of applications of these powers. A plan for building of a community. Oh, and the earth can nourish 1,000 times more men than now exist, etc., Sounds familiar. This is one of the first post-scarcity books ever written. The subjects include the importance of renewable energy in a systems approach, applying machines to labor, of course, adapting human values through education, and creating an abundance. Here are some quotes. The first elements of mechanics teach that there is no motion imaginable that could not be produced by some adapted mechanism provided we have the requisite power. We have superabundance of power, a million times greater than all men on earth could affect hitherto. The powers are chiefly to be derived from the wind, from the tide, from sunshine, and the heat of the sun. Each of these powers requires no consumption of materials, only materials for the construction of the machineries. Once established, there will be no occasion for any work except the superintendence of machinery, which requires one to three persons in all, these being relative, of the whole community, if done, by, done in turns, every adult would hardly have one turn for one day's superintendence in the whole year, but it would probably be done voluntarily, being about an amusement 
no tedious occupation of labor. Today, we drudge in toil and agriculture and in manufactories, making many useful and many useless things for human life, for supplying many various demands and necessities, comforts, and luxuries. We care little about the real benefit our industry may afford to the buyer, provided we make money by their sale. There is an endless variety of artificial productions of every kind resulting from competition of the producers. What virtue can be in passing one's life like a prisoner in the treadmill? The occupations of manner or present state of advancement are yet not much better. They are either a monotonous drudgery or some insipid occupation, which nothing but custom and necessity may render tolerable in some degree, but which are the very means to keep the mind in inactivity in low, trivial pursuits. What is the mighty object of leading such a life? Of course, to get money in order to buy what one wants. Is this the most exalted virtue, the highest destination of man's life that can be thought of in this world? It may be a virtue or a necessary evil in a state of general ignorance and prejudice, but it is no virtue found in nature. Does any of this sound familiar? This book is called The Paradise Within the Reach of All Men Without Labor by the Powers of Machine of Nature and Machinery, and it was written almost 200 years ago in 1833. That's about 50 years before the first light bulb was invented. Etzler envisioned a society that harnessed renewable energies in various ways, plugging them into power steam engines and using those engines in turn to facilitate automation, uh, stopping human servitude and drudgery, and hence the creation of his view of a global abundance. He even talks about creating composite materials out of wood dust and particles and approaching architecture through molding and extrusion along with mixed-use concepts such as ocean-powered steam vessels that are desalinating water at the same time as producing energy. And, of course, he implies little need for the market or monetary system and saw it as a waste of life and inefficient. It's safe to say that, historically speaking, Etzler appears to be one of the first to promote the most core framework of what TZM generally embraces. His primitive but lucid analysis regarding the potential of science and technology to help humanity through Earth-based natural law design is really missing nothing when you read his work. His overall technical perspective is sound. And, of course, it didn't take long for Etzler to be derisively labeled as the first technological utopianist, a term that has persisted ever since, as I'm sure many here have heard. And to this, he jauntingly added, but there will be men who are so ill-favored by nature they slovenly adhere to their accustomed narrow notions without inquiring into the truth of new ideas and will rather, in apology for their mental sloth, pride themselves in despising, disputing, and ridiculing whatever appeals novel to them. Again, sound familiar? Now, I will admit to his discredit, if you read him, uh, he's a bit gratuitous. Uh, he does go overboard with his vision of this so-called paradise, and it's often, often difficult to read through his work without getting an over-exaggerated sense, an unrealistic sense due to his rhetoric, which I think is common with a lot of people, a lot of futurists throughout history. And he also, sadly enough, did fail in his lifetime to produce the engineering that he sought, and uh, mainstream history uh, pretty much sees him as delusional, as a delusional mad scientist. Now, all that noted, that historical little tidbit, let's do a thought experiment. Let's assume we went back to 1833, the time of this book, but instead of using Etzler's primitive version of what could be a resource-based economy with renewable energy-powered steam engines moving steel and wood automation machines to free labor, we instead transplanted the current, common, 21st century technology into 19th century. Remember, Etzler's idea of paradise was to remove the need for labor drudgery and create abundance in the material climate he knew at the time. Keep that in mind. Back then, there were no powered cars, no home-wired electricity, no planes. We hadn't even hit the Victorian era yet. Life was very simple in comparison to today. And just as we today have little clue what material life will be like 200 years from now, how could we expect Etzler to perceive any differently? Again, his vision of paradise was based upon the expectations, values, and ambitions of the time. It's a very important point. Back to the issue. It is needless to say that there's certainly no question that 21st century technology as we know it could create the material expectations of an upper class, 
lifestyle, standard of living, respective to the early to mid 19th century without labor for income, assuming a shift in the social system, of course. Absolutely no question. And again, before I go further, please understand that this is an argumentative abstraction. This is a speculation. As if we're aliens that came, from, came down in 1833 to install automated tech, filling in whatever industry was doing at the time, the means of production and interest to satisfy the interest of the time. So I don't want anyone to read into this to think that this is some static state of concept of technology, because really, in truth, when technology develops, it changes our values. So keep that in mind. This is about a material expectation of a given culture at a given time. And the abstract, abstract question I pose to you all is, would it be enough? Would you be satisfied with your ability to be free of servitude, living a high standard of living for 1833, free to pursue interests as you saw fit, even though it's still 1833? Obviously, from the standpoint of today's material culture, it's rather hard to accept that, right? Because we're so acclimated to life today in its relatively advanced technological state. Well, with that in mind, how about this? What if I told you that tomorrow all of you will have access to an upper-class home, access to 3D printing means that can produce everything material you may need, given our traditions at the time? Global transportation was free and fast. Organic, or your food is organic, pure, freely available through automated vertical farms, and so on. Hence, your life would now be open to pursue, again, your own interests and projects with no need to fear for your basic economic survival without servitude or monotonous labor, hence what we promote as a resource-based economy. I would be very surprised if anyone here would, would deny this condition and the cultural satisfaction, clearly, that it would generate. But wait, what if we shot ahead 200 years from now and humanity is now darting around the universe at near the speed of light, living on various planets just for a change of scenery? facilitating a seemingly almost infinite amount of goods by today's standards through nanotechnology or the like. And perhaps, I don't know, even pressing little buttons on their wrists that give them instant orgasms. <laughs> In that world, 21st century society would be pretty, pretty crappy, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be just as primitive in that future view as we look back on the 19th century. So what's my point? Well, material expansion... Material expansion is the term I'm using here. I hope that makes sense. After the core universally shared needs of all people are met is transient. It has to be. It's meaningless. It's like stepping forward on an escalator, moving the other direction at the same time. It goes nowhere. One, for example, cannot successfully argue that the merit of an advanced technological society with all the frills that we see in the West today is somehow better than a culture, say, that lives without any such modern communication, electricity, or an arsenal of hedonistic toys, but due to their worldview, their exposure, and their values, they are actually satisfied with their standard of living. They are happy and have high relative public health as a result. What's the problem? It goes nowhere because material expansion mistakes a social process that actually serves as a tool of communication for societal bonding. It mistakes this, this, this element that is there for us to share with each other for an end in and of itself, as I will explain. Put another way, this assumption of material progress and the illusion of infinite wants it creates has little to do with the function of some good and everything to do with the social relationship it creates. It is about social connection, for better or for worse. And the most critical aspect of, of this is that it's largely out of our control. It's pretty much hardwired and subconscious, built right into our evolutionary psychology. If there is anything that has become increasingly clear in cognitive neuroscience, is that we are created and defined by others at every stage of our physical and psychological development. And I know this may seem trite to many of us in TZM, but I realized recently that we really don't understand how dramatic this is, how profound it is when it comes to what we think is important and why we act the way we do. In the 13th century, King Frederick II of Sicily decided he wanted to figure out what the natural language of humans were. Some said it would be Greek, some said it would be Latin. So to figure it out, the king took 50 infants upon birth, gave them the best food, little rooms, general conditions, but limited all human communication and contact. 
to see what these children would grow up naturally speaking. What happened? They all died of stress dwarfism, which comes from a lack of human contact. Human contact is a hardwired human requirement for development. We've evolved to learn and to learn from other people. Natural selection has programmed us to expect certain things to occur as we grow, and virtually all of these relate to interactions with other human beings. Critical periods, as they're termed, is one form. Language, for example, can only be, heard, be learned from others at a very specific time in development. And the spectrum of influence when what should happen doesn't, or what shouldn't happen does, generates predictable consequence, consequences across the entire human population. For example, it is well established that children not given the opportunity to form proper emotional attachment as infants very often end up as maladjusted adults. Likewise, we imitate each other constantly and subconsciously, just as how babies impulsively imitate facial expressions they see around them as they develop. We have mirror neurons that fire in sympathy when watching other people's actions, and we generally sense others' pain and happiness in empathy. Some even have an advanced condition called mirror touch synesthesia, and when they watch violence, like a boxing match, they literally feel it. They actually can't witness anything violent. We are easily primed. The term primed is fascinating. Countless studies show how easy it is, is, easy it is to elevate confidence and destroy it. This is why bullying works. If you think that you are stupid or inferior, if you're being told that over and over again, even if you have the strongest will, if you're consistently beaten down, you'll begin to act that way. And if you really want to see something spooky about our hardwired social nature, throw the average individual into a crowd or get them to identify with a group. We have this limbic system response that drops our sense of critical thought in many cases. It drops our inhibition, our volition, and our independence when the herd gets excited. If I right now, or if someone over here screamed bomb, or everyone just simply made the motion to go this way, just the motion, people would follow along in a flock-like behavior. Our limbic system simply responds that way. Not to mention the group think that's so common out there, and our detachment from responsibility when we're associated with another group and they're behind us supporting. Uh, any teenager knows what peer pressure does and the things, the decisions that are made that would never be made if they were alone do to that influence. So coming back to the main issue, what all this means uh, in material culture, sociologist Charles Cooley probably put it best, I am not what I think I am, and I am not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. <laughs> we literally define ourselves in social terms and assume assumed social responsibilities, which is why, statistically, one in five now, one in five suicides are now linked to simply being unemployed. Culture has created the story that if you don't have a job, then you lose your social value. Completely social connection. A study done back uh, a few years back in Fiji took Western commercial television into an area, didn't have it before, and after being introduced to the fashion, thin characters, and social associations of beauty and success, the culture exposed saw a dramatic rise in unheard of eating disorders and newly found interest to be thin and fashionable in other commercial attributes. <laughs> and since I've been criticized for not having much comic relief in, in any of my presentations, <laughs> I present to you Charlie Sheen. Charlie brought the word, where's Ben? Ben? Winning. Winning. Into Western pop culture. He spent weeks in the media spotlight explaining how great he was due to his wealth status a couple years back. By the way, I bring this up not to, to pose hate on Charlie, but to show how his mainstream values and social sense encapsulates almost everything set forward by the system we live in, the favoring of wealth status and competition. When he was asked what he thought of those that said he might not be winning, he said, they can say that, but what kind of car are they driving? What kind of girls are in their home? You are either winning or you're losing. There's nothing in between. I'm going to win inside of every moment, and they can just find the most comfortable chair in their small house and sit back and w enjoy the show. 
And, and I hope I'm not the only one who can appreciate the unintended double entendre at the end of that statement. Now, what is my point? Those familiar with TZM know we have talked a lot about something called structural violence. In fact, you'll hear another talk on that today. Uh, specifically, the biopsychosocial manifestation of violence that occurs by exposure to certain social circumstances, such as, for example, the fact that people with low socioeconomic status have been found to correlate with high incidence of heart disease. It isn't about what they're eating. It isn't their lack of exercise. It is simply about the stress of the way they feel. And the way we feel in this world is almost exclusively a social consequence. In the words of Robert Sapolsky, it isn't about being poor. It's about feeling poor. And when you see the emerging class divide now, we are not just seeing an injustice. We're seeing really a public health crisis in the making. And the real task at hand, the real adaptation to come back to the form of this lecture, is to redefine the social contract, to redefine how we actually look at each other. Because really, that is all that matters to any of us, whether we're aware of it or not. So in conclusion to this mildly rambling presentation, when it comes to the future of our society, when it comes to the heart of a sustainable culture, when it comes to the precondition that can set the stage of a new relationship, not only with each other, but with the habitat itself, I think this material gain status continuum trap is going to be one of the most profound philosophical problems facing all of us and the culture at large those that are, of course, in the normal sphere, most of all. And it will be the core force distracting the public from understanding the general logic of the new social system we talk about, based on balance, sustainability, and human trust, true social capital, the only reason we exist. And our adaptation to understand the critical need to alter this distorted current sense of relationship, or to use old language, to alter this distorted spiritual relationship, is a subject that each of us need to consider in our own communication practices, and I thank you very much.